Okay, thank you to everybody, and particularly thank you to Matt, uh, the other Matt, for um, inviting us to present today. Uh, I'm Justin Lauder, it says here, and uh, I was born and bred in the Re Republic of Yorkshire, uh, so I'm an immigrant as well to <laughs> Lancaster. <coughs> and uh, I've had a varied career. I was originally trained in computing. I then moved more into um, volunteer work after somewhat unemployment, and I ended up working in community development. And of course, community development is all about participation. I worked for a very forward-thinking community architecture practice called Community Regeneration, who are still going. And their phrase, which I remember, was experts on tap, not on top. And I think that's the way of working that I've adopted since then. And I subsequently managed a mental health charity for, for about 10 years. Um, it was the original mind in Manchester, not the one that's there now. Uh, again, I adopted that approach of working with and supporting people in the committee who had their own mental health problems to effectively lead an organisation based on values. Now, values is a key word because values is what I'm going to talk about today in the research technique of value-led personas. So I brought that perspective to my PhD work, which again has developed. I've been fortunate to be here at Lancaster University, a very forward-thinking program called the High Wire Program. It has a very ambitious title, and it's a very ambitious program. It aims to be interdisciplinary, or even post-disciplinary. And it's about bringing together management, computing, and design in various combinations. The combination I started with was management and computing. I've now ended up with management and design. I'll just pause a moment and let people um, settle down. It's okay, just uh, sort of now. We're all quite informal and participatory here, I think. Okay. I'll, oh, yeah, yeah, you can do the thing. Right, excellent. Right. So, our research aim, and this is where I've got to after about three years, I'll give some more background. Um, I can think I can just leave it on the screen and let you read it. If anyone can't read it, then do say, and I'll read it out. Started in 2013 and 2014, I worked with two organisations, uh, Shrimping It and the Northern School of Permaculture. These are emergent micro businesses led by values. With Shrimping It, it's, it's about the value of letting people learn electronics and computing by using the very components in an Arduino um, clone. The Northern School of Permaculture is all about permanent agriculture. But it's not just about agriculture. It's about how people can live together and work together. So their values very much drove the research that I undertook with them. So my research started with their values and developed a way of representing those values. And we came up with a concept of value-led personas to represent their stakeholders in the organization. So it's not just about the values of the founders, but also the values of, of their stakeholders, or everybody who can be affected by the organization. So we came up with the research question. Can the design technique of value-led personas enable engagement with the values of stakeholders? That's not the research question I started out with. That's how it evolved. Because in the design process, it's not just about coming up with a solution, to a problem. It's also about looking, what is the problem? So the problem co-evolves with the solution. So personas are a technique developed in the design of systems for human-computer interaction. Now, the use of the term users in computing actually says a lot about the values of computing. <laughs> and it's, um, which, which is, um, you know, the people design the systems, the people use them. But the designers did realize, well, how can we actually find out the needs of users? How can we rep represent them? And personas are a technique that they, that they evolved to do that. A persona is a fictional individual. It represents the values and beliefs, but also how people will, will interact with the system. 
So we took that idea one step further to create, specifically, value-led personas. Okay? Now, our, our approach took a value-sensitive design approach. Now, value-sensitive design is that that includes criteria that help foster human values. Now, I don't think anybody here could disagree with that, but again, we're coming from a computing perspective, where actually this was kind of novel. So, we're taking these ideas and concepts from, from computing and taking them one step farther. So, I started by working with the two organisations, becoming kind of immersed in them, learning about their culture, learning about their values, learning who interacted with them, and learning who, what made them tick. So, we took a four-stage process. And the first stage was establishing the core values. And this is where I gathered qualitative data, including participating in meetings and discussions, in discussions with founders, <coughs> in looking at their uh, websites, their social media feeds. And from that data, using the program NVivo to extract a number of core values. Now, we had to start somewhere. So we started with existing values frameworks. But then we explored them further in workshops with each organization. So, and at that point, we then introduced value-led personas. And here's a value-led persona. <laughs> <coughs> now, that shows off my artistic skills, which are nearly as good as my singing skills. <coughs> and that was, that was drawn by me from the data showing their values. It's a very simple drawing, and it's a quotation that can encapsulate the values held by this character, in this case, Breadboard Bill. Breadboard Bill represented a, a class of stakeholder of shrimping it, people who were experts in technology, and who wanted to learn how things worked, well, how they really worked, and how to use that technology. And the inspiration for that particular drawing uh, came from uh, attending Bar Camp uh, Blackpool, which was a sort of hackathon. And uh, there were many characters who looked very like that. So, um, so it's about bringing the values back to the organization. And this is an example of where it's actually co-design. Because I'm bringing my understanding of the values and beliefs held by the organization back to the organization. So it's not just their perspective, it's mine as well. So, if we move it on. And here's another value-led persona for the Northern School of Permaculture. It represents the mainly fe female demographic of the stakeholders in their organization. And it re represents a particular sort of person who, who is attracted to it, who is very much about the relationships, not only between people and, and the environment, but also between different people. That are relationships with each other should reflect the values of permaculture itself, of our relationship with the environment, with the planet. So that symbolizes though, symbolize those values. Okay. So for now, uh, move on. Okay, so in the workshop, now I actually drew the, the preceding, there are actually about five of them for each organization. And I drew them beforehand and brought them to the workshop. Besides, with many such processes, and I spell it out now as if I'd worked it out all along, but in reality, the design process itself was a co-evolution process. And at that point, I was thinking about how to represent values back to the organization. But one thing that emerged through the workshops was about the participants co-creating personas. So, we started, so I started by bringing in the, the personas I'd, I'd draw. Then we looked at the values held by the organization, the range of values, and other values emerged. And then participants were invited to create additional personas that more closely represented their values. Okay, this is um, 
trimming it, creating the curious kids persona. If you look carefully, there are other personas that I created. Well, actually, I created that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one as well. But shrimping it created that one is in the process of, cre of creating curious kids. So they added not only to the personas representing their stakeholders, but also to the range of values. So this wasn't just about me bringing those values to the organization. It was also about what values they could also bring. And this one is um, the Northern School of Permaculture, creating some extra personas. They took a different approach. They didn't do them quite as I'd done. They were more creative. And these are also the various um, people involved in Northern School of Permaculture. And their issues, their everyday, you know, how, how can we change the systems? How can we learn for learn's sake? How can people get away from their dead-end job? That's what we talked about yesterday. How can people can contribute to it? Because it's very much about self-help. So this in, in itself revealed a great deal about how the Northern School of Permaculture worked. So I started off that process by bringing in personas, bringing in my perspective, but then they added theirs. Okay. So then we started to look at potential business models. And this is where, it's where it started getting very interesting. So I found this a very powerful process for working with these organizations where I think there was true co-creation. Even before the workshops started, in the discussions with each organization, I brought my ideas about how open source could involve, could be a mechanism to involve stakeholders in value-led organizations. This was very much rooted in my own experience. I mentioned that I'd worked in a charity for 10 years. Why I stopped working there was because the organization closed. And why the organization closed was because it, it, it had chosen a governance structure that was doomed to failure. I learned this while under undertaking an MA course in, from 2008 to 2010. Now, I was very much at the center of this. I was the most senior staff member between a committee that I was trying to support to lead the organization, between a staff team that wanted to go their own way. And a national organization that was bringing its own idea of how the organization could work. This was a very um, intense experience in many ways, but also very much a learning experience. Because it, it left me with a question, how can we create governance structures that actually involve stakeholders appropriately? And that's what I brought to Highwire. So during those discussions before the workshop started, we talked about guild-like models. And I found a connection in the literature between open source and guilds. Now, that isn't really what I'm going to be talking about today, but to do have some information on it if people wish. The point being that I had a possible guild model, which I conceptualized as the open source guild. So after we looked at the personas, we then looked at the model and how the personas could interact with that. So, we found this, as I said, a, a very powerful process. Uh, just move on. Oh, um, could, could, could you go back one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, so, sorry, um, back to the other one. <laughs> yeah. Um, go on, keep, keep going. <coughs> I'm not sorry, you, you're going backwards. <laughs> stop, stop. Right. Technology. Right. Okay, sorry about that, technical age. Okay, this is how shrimping it expressed the guild model. I remember in the workshop a really powerful discussion about how they could operate as a guild. And that's where I felt true co-creation co was happening. Because I brought my experience, and brought my experiences, but they also brought their own perspective. And this is, this is their take on it. The very next week, they were doing a stand at the Manchester Mini Maker Fair, and they expressed a possible good light model. And this is how people can interact with it. They buy kits, they can get their own parts, they were very transparent about where the parts came from. 
They could hack their own devices and learn from their website. They could learn which ramp unit itself. They could then teach others. And through that, earn a living. All under the umbrella of shrimping it, which in an illegal sense doesn't exist. It's an idea, it's a name, it's a concept, it's a set of values. And that's what came out really strongly. That you can bring people together under a set of values in, in a guild line model. And uh, if you look at the next one, again, the Northern School Permaculture. They've been working for over 10 years. And this is sort of their business model. And what I did, as I was told by the founder of Old School Permaculture, was help conceptualize what they've been doing in the last 10 years. So again, I was learning from them on how a guild could work, linking it with my own experience and conceptualizing it. So they developed their model father in a series of diagrams. That's just one of them. So, so I mentioned that this was uh, research took place in um, 2014 as well. We had a, another stage of the research. So if we just move on, this this were this workshop. The first workshop was much more exploratory. It, it came up with the two concepts of the value-led persona in the outsource guild. The second workshop focused more on developing value-led personas themselves. So I explored the potential of value-led personas as a methodological tool. So, so we imagined the value-led personas in more detail. Uh, if you move it on, it shows one. So, so you remember seeing that from the photograph. I took the cartoon and I wrote a piece of fiction. Now this is building on my understanding of the organization plus the persona that they created in the first workshop. So this is my sort of fictional representation of Open Oscar. Uh, not sure if we can read it from the back there, but it um, describes how Oscar supports the values of open source and wishes to experiment with open hardware, starting with the Arduino, but he likes a shrimp, because the shrimp is the very components itself that you put together and program yourself. So Oscar supports the values of openness and wishes to work with shrimping it because of that. So, and again, if you move it on. So this again is uh, my extension of friendly freedom from the first workshops. So again, th this is building in more detail, which was from my qualitative research about how Frida got involved um, with uh, the old school permaculture, having seen them on Twitter. She liked their planetary repair work and their values of relatedness. Took the course. And then at the end, she says, Frida liked to tell people how even a window box can express the larger permaculture principles of permaculture just as a small but growing group of permaculture designers can express the large society they're aiming to create. That feels sort of encapsulates what the old school permaculture was about. Now one outcome from the second workshop is that the process generated a lot more personas because the participants, I invited participants to say, well, who is missing from the personas that we've created all, all together? So again, it's moving another step towards true co-creation. Co <coughs> so, so again, you can see this is an emergent process. That the, the idea of co-creation starts out very, very small, but it's gradually expanded as being the key aspect of value-led personas and of the methodology that uses them. Okay, so, so two two outcomes from this, which I'm going to be exploring in further research, is one is how to use this, this technique of co-create value personas very much from the start. So it's about co-creating them with participants right from the beginning. So there's two strands to that. One is how 
This can help participants understand their stakeholders and gather data on them in a very rapid way. So instead of me spending months doing qualitative data gathering, it may be possible to create them there and then in a workshop with participants. And the other is then how these personas could be used in a code design method methodology to look at governance structures. We're seeing the Open Source Guild as being an example of a co-design governance structure. So my research will explore how personas and other design techniques can enable organizations to co-design governance structures to overcome the problems that I had previously identified. So I think that's kind of in a nutshell where I am. There's a lot to communicate in that time. So um, do you have any questions? <laughs> Questions at the end, because that might be part of the discussion. Okay, right. I'm now going to hand over. So there will be an opportunity for questions. But I'm now going to hand over to my glamorous bearded assistant, who is going to lead us in some co design. Okay, can I take the microphone, please? For right. This? I shall now hand over the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I shall try and get the thing out of my pocket without breaking it. Thanks very much. Okay, this is me, my limits of technology. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Justin. I'm, of course, I'm supervising Justin's PhD. I'm really interested in this use of the value led personas. I actually think that, and I hope that Justin can explore further. This use of personas, not just to capture values, but to capture very quickly and very succinctly all the different people who might be involved in something. If I look around this room, I've got all these different people here with different agendas, different reasons for being here, different things they want to get out of it. And it's it, what I think that's valuable with this tool, not just for the research around governance and around capturing the values of everybody who might be involved in it an organisation, but is also in its much wider sense for participatory research. How do we picture and map all the people who might be involved in a piece of research or in an undertaking or in a project or in coming here today? All those, how do we capture that? How does Matthew sit down before doing this and start that first bit, like Justin did, of, right, how can I just basically capture Get an idea of what everybody coming might want to get out of it. And personas to me seem such a quick shorthand. But then to go beyond that and to talk to the research participants about can we map your, not only your own values but other people around you. I was thinking very much about the project that you kindly portrayed your own experiences of yesterday. And very much we're looking at people, all of you in your own ways are in some ways community representatives. The whole community around the Gold Coast or around Brisbane of Aboriginal peoples is not represented, you're representatives. Is there some way we can take this one step forward, the second workshop if you like, to say we can use this as a tool to map all the people who, the reasons why people might want to involve in shrimping it, or the different approaches, or the p reasons people might want to involve in your project, but also can we teach you to do that, Mary, so you can picture all the reasons, the different reasons that people who you're representing that you might want to feed in, so you don't forget people. Can we, and it's a very quick model for really capturing the participatory nature of any activity, whether it's research, whether it's a conference, whether it's designing governance structures. So why I was very interested in this invitation from Matthew, and I said, oh, you must ask Justin, was firstly I want Justin to present his work, but I'd also like, and in the spirit of participation, I think it's also valuable for us as researchers to think how else can we use this apart from the values that people involved in an organisation might do, is there beyond that. So we'll admit that there's something for us in this, and we hope, also hope it might teach you a little skill that you can take on to map projects in advance and then to work with participants for them to map 
their reasons for being involved and to think about the stakeholders they represent. So it becomes a cascade of capture. Does that make any sense? Okay. In the spirit of that, and this is not about being able to draw. One of the reasons I love Justin's approach is he can draw much better than me. And it's not wonderful. Okay? This isn't about being able to sing or dance. This is about being able to, is in your own very scratchy cartoon way, to try and capture values. Can I just ask if you could drag a, a couple of those? <coughs> so these value-led personas that Justin's developed are a technique for representing stakeholders in an organisation that's value-led. So one's about open source, one's about permaculture, and they want to understand all the values of the potential stakeholders. I'd like you to think beyond values. It might be a value-led thing, but there's other variables. Dreadful words for a qualitative piece of work. But it could be a motivation-led. It could be... A, it might not be about people's values, but it might be about capturing the motivations for people to be involved in something. So what I'm going to ask is that, very quickly, that you think about, first of all, yourselves. What was your motivation either for attending today or for engaging in the research project as a participant? Make your own choice. In the nature of scratchy cartoons, about three or four minutes. So a quick drawing doesn't have to be of yourself, but of your reasons. And a little sentence underneath, that little single sentence quote. So your reasons for coming today or your reasons for engaging in the project in its longer basis. Is that... Any questions on that? OK, let's have a quick go at that and see what you capture, if you wish. OK. If anybody's willing to share their persona, any thoughts, or anybody willing to contribute? And it's just a, a, a kind of a half-smiling face with a question mark over yes. the um, And the quotation is, I wanted to learn about participatory projects and enjoy meeting different people. Great, so... Uh, it's kind of too, like... Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's challenging because I have multiple motivations. That's fine. That, it's you know, absolutely it's like fine. I'm just generally interested. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that what you'll find is that we've all got multiple reasons for being involved. And this stakeholder mapping, using simple cartoons, it's, a really good, it's not necessarily about you as an individual, it's about all the reasons. Yeah. So Matthew could use this very simple thing with a row of circles with some pretty faces in to just capture what are all the reasons people might want to come. How can we start meeting these reasons? So it becomes a, a project planning tool as well as a participation tool, trying to acknowledge participants. But as I say, it can cascade beyond. OK. We can start to see already some of the different reasons why people have engaged. Now, you've looked at yourselves in this. It may be for Matthew if he said, oh, actually, next time I do this, I'm just going to try this as a little tool. It may be that it's his imaginings, workshop one of Justin's. Or it's some idea, because he's met lots of people, but... <laughs> And he's done this now, so he's got some experience. But in a lot of ways, it's something he'd propose into the group who then develop that and add new things to it. What I would be interested in is to see if, in a project like this, if that tool was used, that then he came to all of you who are participants in this project and said, before you talk just from yourselves and from your wider communities... Let's try this experience to, for you to try and map the different stakeholders in your community. It's a very quick thing. Everybody managed it in a very quick... I gave you two and a half minutes, even though I said three minutes, to start to capture where you're coming from. And what's really exciting me about Justin's work is that this very, very simple tool, I've started using it as a little scratch thing in the corner... I do an awful lot of work with local community groups in Lancaster. And it's got me thinking about, before I step in, not just think about the person who invited me, my preconceptions, can I empathise? Can I put myself in their shoes and think, 
What are all the different reasonings behind this? So I'm going in. Firstly, it opens my mind. I think outside of the box and laterally. I then would like to, and this is the first time I've tried it with a group, with Justin's permission, his methodology, I would like to start using this as I go into groups to start matching the individuals there and their wider stakeholders. Because I think that there's a cascade there. And if they're going to go out and talk to their constituents, their members of the group, can they use this tool? So we start, it starts to help us plan things, to capture input, but also, I think, very interestingly, if we use that cascade, we can then feed that back and use that as a data capture to really reflect the communities that we're working with. So I think there's an iterative process up and beyond and back into the researcher that's capturing people and giving them skills all the way down the line. I think it's fantastic, Justin's input to this, because what he's come up with is very, very novel and very simple. And you could use it with a group of kids, you can use it with a group of people with learning disabilities, you can use it with a very sophisticated audience like yourselves. And it's a very good way, I think, of mapping input into a project and capturing participation. Don't know your thoughts on it, be really interested. As I say, what we want out of this <laughs> is to extend, what I want out of it is to extend Justin's thinking beyond the constraints of his PhD to the wider implications of his methodology, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Okay, thanks. Any uh, questions? Uh, indeed. Uh, um, so I was wondering, how do you capture the power positions or the precariousness um, or the resources under the that are open to the different actors involved? That's a very interesting question. I think we capture it in the more detailed descriptions. Mm -hmm. So this is where, um, as a co-researcher, my research into the organisation of stakeholders is very useful. Because I can offer my perspective on the power relationships. But not only that as a facilitator, I can encourage participants, not just the founder, but also members of the organisation and their stakeholders to explore these power relations. So I'd say, probably in, in a nutshell, it's more about interactions between the other sellers that these power relations can be brought up. Can I add to that? And it's a supposition and a thought is that there's no reason you couldn't use these quick cartoon personas to look at power relationships within an organisation, within a project, or in anything else. So we could call it a power-led persona. I'm just worried that it could end up a bit fluffy. It can, could end up fluffy. I think that, and I think that that's a valid criticism. And as Justin said, this is a work in progress. Um, but it could be used in terms of economic power, in terms of power over an organisation or over a project, mm -hmm. or the disempowerment of certain people, um, whatever that might be. But it's about people's own views rather than, so it's very qualitative and, mm -hmm. if you like, phenomenological, rather than saying this is how it is, it's how it's perceived at the moment. And just quickly to follow on, I also see the incredible value of your technique for a way of having a conversation about power relationships that's fairly protected, you know, and doesn't force people to be in each other's face, but you have an indirect conversation about power relations and dynamics. I think it's really interesting. Using the personas also means you're not necessarily talking about yourself. Yeah. You can yeah. use them to disembody yeah, yeah. aspects of power yeah, on, a, on a table. <laughs> and uh, that's, I think, is how the technique of personas can be deceptively simple but very powerful, because they precisely have that playful aspect which I think, as you pointed out, allows these very difficult issues to be dealt with in a safe environment. And then from having dealt with them in that safe environment, people can then apply that to their everyday work. Yeah, and I think you had a question as well. Sorry, yes. Well, Sarah mentioned the, the fact that people might have multiple motivations, mm -hmm. but it's also true that people might not... Uh, my, sorry, I might have mixed motivations, but it's also true that people might not be aware of what their motivations mm. actually are. I mean, familiarly in psychology and in philosophical psychology, there are, there are revealed preferences. So yes, people yes. will ordinarily and sincerely say, I, my motivation is, is this or that. Or, but their behavior reveals that that's not it at all. That's not the reason they're doing it. So I just wonder about the, the limitations of this, where it deals with people's own understandings mm. of 
mm. of, of their motivation, particularly within a, within a, a large or collaborative project. In, in my experience, the difficulties come very often precisely from the fact that the way people understand themselves is not the way they present to other people. Mm. And those are huge problems yes. <laughs> I, for all of us. I personally, and Justin can answer differently, I personally particularly see the value in that cascade, if you like, of it being people looking at what's the potential values of others who are engaged. So Shrimpin it drew up these personas, it presented some as an example, and then they drew up more, they drew up more, and then they presented their advert for their thing as in to, to attract different potential clients. Somebody who was interested in buying it off the shelf, of sourcing it themselves, of redigging their own devices, of learning with others, of teaching others. So they're capturing the other potential values. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I think it perhaps so, goes back a bit also to the question of conflict resolution. Yes. I mean, you know, well, well, look, let me talk about something I know about for a change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you have you know, students in the seminar group, that I, I remember this remarkable young woman uh, whose first name was Tuesday, and Tuesday never stopped talking. She was, she was a lovely girl, she was very able, but she just never stopped talking. And, and it was embarrassing and awkward, because this is the, the organiser of the, the seminar. I had to really quite vigorously get her to shut up so that, that Mousy Mary can get a word in, that's, that's, since we're in this. So I was, you know, in the entire time, I, you know, I'm saying, Tuesday, I think Mary here has something that she would like to say. Um, and you can't say it, this is very familiar, you can't say it in a way that, that's really robust, because all that happens then is that Mousy Macy, you know, is completely, completely silenced, whereas Tuesday carries on regardless. <laughs> At the end of the term, the students have to put in, you know, the evaluation, how did they enjoy the seminar, this and that. Oh, Tuesday thought it was all absolutely lovely, it was all wonderful, everything was splendid. The only thing Tuesday wished was that she had more chance to talk. <laughs> and I thought, Tuesday, you know, what planner are you on? And so it's this kind of thing, and if you're dealing with, I mean, that's not a, you know, it's not a case of conflict resolution or anything like, but it must be, this is about human nature and about our own perceptions of our, ourselves and of others. It, Tuesday's perception of herself is that she's a really quiet, demure little girl who occasionally says something that is not intrusive, and she's wrong. <laughs> she's wrong about herself and about the values that she has. She, she really values collaboration. She's, she wants to listen to her. What does Tuesday like? Sharing. She likes to hear others' views. And you, know, you can see people think, if only... But she's well, not the only one. There was also Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a couple of perspectives on this. One, one, I think, is that personas could be used to explore what are the problems in the classroom. So people could draw personas representing... Tuesday. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it depersonalizes it, and it makes it more of a, such a general problem. Well, okay, what is the problem yeah. if, if somebody talks too much? <coughs> and it becomes less personal. So it, has, so it offers a potential technique to enable these difficult issues to be dealt with mm -hmm. in, in a kind of supportive and playful environment. And then people can, can learn from that. The, the other is a more interesting perspective. And, uh, and this is where it links back to my work with mental health. And, you know, working to support and empower people. And it's where um, my work relates to that of Anne, Anne Light, who has worked in a participatory way with various excluded groups. She worked with them to help them create fantasy personas. In one particular example, he was represented by a glove. And she describes this particular woman who creates this fantasy persona and creates attributes for this fantasy persona, but then gradually realised, actually in reality, the persona was her, and those attributes were her. So again, by creating this external object, this persona, who can help realise aspects of themselves who 
and how they can interact with, with, with other people, again, in the same environment. And, and that is a very interesting strand to the research, which I'm looking to develop further. And uh, how, how people can not only empower others and work with others, but also empower themselves. I wondered um, about this applicability in a profit-making organisation, um, because I wonder if there's a little, or the potential for a disconnect, because there's something of an assumption here that an employee of a profit-making organisation personally matches the values of that organisation. So if I give you an example, um, when I was a student, um, I had a, a job essentially selling, selling alcohol in an off-licence. And there was a, a chap who would come in most of the time when I was working there, and he was, he was an alcoholic, and he admitted to being an alcoholic quite openly. And as part of my role, I was meant to sell him as much as I could, but that went against my values because I knew it was damaging his health. So there, there would be a disconnect for me. Now, I can, I can produce something, and, and I found it a really useful tool for my research project, but I wonder if it's going to apply quite so neatly in a different, in a corporate environment. I can see the real advantage, this slide, I'll just turn up the nearest slide, <laughs> for marketing, for a corporate. This is about a value-led organisation, in fact, so open source it doesn't really exist. It's a virtual guild of people coming together and sharing. But by identifying the potential stakeholders in terms of the market, a commercial company could use this very well to identify one, two, three, four, five, six different marketing strategies to grab all different sorts of people who might be interested in the shrimping it approach to open source technology. Okay? So it can be used by commercial organisations very easily in terms of marketing. I'd be interested to look at an internal stakeholder analysis with it. Maybe that's next. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's the additional that's chapter when you run out of words. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would like to add to that. I wouldn't say a problem with the uh, commercial company using this technique because it could help it to understand, as Mark pointed out, its internal stakeholders. Mm. So it could have a persona representing an employee who is very much with the values of the organisation and wishes to rise in it. We could also have another persona who is just turning up to get their paycheck and doesn't sympathise with the values of the organisation. So these personas could then represent these groups of internal stakeholders and the problems that they might have. You know, so, so we have, you know, we deal with, with the personas. How do we deal with passive aggressive Peter and manipulative Mary, who are people who tend to turn up in more of any group? Yeah. Can I just add to that as well? It's also the, one of the other things you have to think about working with people is that they're not telling you what they think you want to know. Mm. Yeah. You need to yeah. make sure that that's written in, particularly when you're working in, in communities with so different cultural mm. communities yeah. as well. Absolutely. Um, and you're shaping the way that they're reflecting to you, using image and word in a way that uh, in yours, you know, we, you tried to teach us a song, we didn't, we shaped the way that you, so you're shaping people's responses by using a structure. It depends how far you want to take it. I still think it's fantastically useful in planning of participatory research in a way. Without, and you may never show that to people. That might be just when you're sitting down to map it. You think, right, if I'm going to participate with this community, what are all their different motivations? <laughs> you just have to be aware of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, it also becomes a tool for capturing that participation, but not necessarily. Okay. We're not sure where it can go. I know where it's going, but I think that there's loads of potential for this in other scenarios. And, and that potential is very much what I'm looking to develop in the next year or so. And as I explained, this is very much at the developmental stage. We're not handing it over as a finished product. This is very much a process where your comments and your thoughts and your involvement have helped to contribute to what the technique could be. So we really appreciate your listening and your feedback. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, uh, on behalf of Justin, who won't blow his own trumpet, uh, the Open Source Guild, which is the actual artefact that has resulted from this research, is a really interesting um, value-led flat project governance structure for projects, for undertakings, for businesses. And I'm just going to leave these on the side for people to pick up, go on the website, 
feed anything back to Justin on this because this will probably go beyond the PhD as something that's worth capture. So I'll leave those here for people to pick up. Have a look. I find this really fascinating. It, it overlaps with the discussion yesterday about <laughs> citizen science and crowdsourcing yeah. and so on. Um, and of course, there are all sorts of risks with this kind of work, some of which is the type of stuff um, Sue was talking about, getting to the truth, getting to really what's going on, um, and all the problem of people telling you what they... Um, and I think if we... We could almost head down two kind of paths. If we, if we take up those, the risks or those kind of objections and we really indulge those, we head, in a sense, don't want to make this too value-laden, but we head back to a way in which we've done knowledge previously, which is empowering the expert who's able to develop techniques to cut through and to peer into what is really true and what people's revealed preferences are and so on and so forth. Or we go deeper down the other path of more crowdsourcing, more engagement with people, hopefully, while acknowledging all the messiness of that, finding some way for the, the density of those techniques to be able to reveal data which is never going to be true or fully accurate, but close enough um, to some sort of truth and enables us to work and do things with people in the process. And I think Justin's demonstrated every time we put an objection to Justin about this stuff, he just says, use another, use another one of these uh, persona to explore precisely that. And that's what he's doing. He's uh, running and, and, and in almost a kind of a, a pragmatist kind of mode, we could say, in terms of political philosophy, um, in terms of philosophical mode of engaging with knowledge and so on. So, you know, I just think this is... And I, I don't have any, any sort of particular comment about where I sit on that. I just think it's a really... These kind of uh, different ways of doing research and knowledge are throwing up these kind of questions, and it's uh, interesting to, to think about. I, I have one response to that, and to that, the points that you alluded to, which is that... Are we trying to capture truth when we're looking at people yeah. and how they interact? I don't think we are. We're looking to see how they construct their reality, how they walk through their lives, and how they think about it and represent it. We're not looking for truth. We're looking for understanding. And how to do things together. And how to do things together. Now, this doesn't capture truth. This captures the, how people construct a social reality to get academic about it. And that's what I'm interested in my research. I've never looked for truth and prove I've never run a hypothesis in my life. I look for everything I did right is about an exploration of, not uh, does this happen or not. And this is, a, to me, a fantastic way of exploring it that I hope Justin starts to realise goes well beyond a business model, a, a governance structure, but really is a, an interesting way to capture things in a broader sense. So. OK, thank you. I'll switch down. This uh, exercise and this discussion has helped me realise the possibilities. So again, thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>